little bit of a cough, so she wanted to stay away just so that um, everything would be fine. There's going to be a new sign-up sheet along with this information. By the time you walk out of this room after service, this will be on the back table. So please take the time to sign up again. And um, she looks forward to... Uh, she looks forward to, yeah, hold on to that for me, would you, Liz? She looks forward to seeing all of you this weekend. That being said, we are in Colossians 2. <coughs> you get my chili together now. <laughs> and we've been in Colossians 2, and I've told you that... that in Colossians, the first two chapters are doctrine, 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 doctrine. Paul is telling us things that are true. And when we get to chapters 2 and 3, he's going to tell us what to do with it. We're going to get into application, application, application. But we're still in chapter 2, and we're still in doctrine. And if you'll remember a couple weeks ago, when last we spoke about this, um, we were looking at words like um, uh, mystery. Paul talking about uh, mystery that God wants to make known to all people. Uh, we talked about uh, philosophy and being deceived by fancy words. And I realized I didn't really tell you why that's in there. If I did, I don't remember, so I'm going to do it again. There's a couple of things, a couple of false teachings that this church in Colossae was being faced with. And it's a couple things that once you know about them, you can see, ah, yes, Paul is, is addressing these things. Um, and what he's doing is he's loading them up with doctrine, with truth about Jesus, so that they'll be able to see that these false teachings are false. And one of those things is... Uh, uh, a thing called Gnosticism, and I know I've mentioned that before in, in some of our studies. Gnosticism was a, um, a teaching that came into the church. It wasn't separate from, it didn't say, no, 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 you guys have got it all wrong. Here's the real truth. It, it's, it's a more deceptive kind of false teaching than that because they say, yes, what you guys are being taught, that's right. And that's good. And it's good you're being taught that. But what you're missing is this. There's some extra things that you don't know about. But we know about them. And we're going to let you know what those are. And we need to be on the lookout for those things. You say, well, that's not really a problem in this church. Uh, and I don't believe that it is. But we have not finished living our lives on this earth yet. And who knows what the future holds for us. And who knows if we will come across situations like what is what Paul is addressing here. So we need to be aware of them. Um, so that when if we come across these things, we'll go, well, wait a minute. Uh, this sounds like something that, that we studied a long time ago. And I remember this, and I'm not going get, to get caught up in that. That's one benefit to looking at this. The other benefit to looking at, at this is any time we come across... A section in scripture, and the funny thing is, it's all of scripture, where we're getting, I don't want to say pounded, that's a hard, it's like somebody taking their Bible and hitting you over the head with it, but we're, we're getting pounded with truth about Jesus, and, and one after another, after another, after another, even if we don't have a problem with Gnostics coming in here and trying to spread false teaching, What's wrong with getting pounded about truth with truth about Jesus? So, we're going to look at that, and, and then the we may get into it today. The, there's a second false teaching that Paul is going to address before we finish the second chapter, and that is the teaching of what was called the Judaizers, and those were they were Christians and they were Jews, and they said that's great. You're a Christian, you're a Jew, that's great. You're a Christian, you're a Gentile, that's great. Um, follow all these things you've been taught, but there's a couple extra things you have to do. Like, got to get circumcised. 
you know, if you really, if, if you're going to be a Christian and, and you you really want to be saved, you're going to have to get circumcised. Um, and along with a bunch of other things, but but that is something specifically that that Paul will address here, and. Um, I can tell you the men at Colossae were very relieved when they got this letter. <laughs> okay, we're going to start in chapter 2, verse 6. We've already kind of covered it, but we're going to go back there to uh, set the groundwork for moving forward. Chapter 2, verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him. Now remember two weeks ago, who remembers talking about those two words in him? How that's that's covenantal language. And we talked a little bit about covenant, and we can't really get into it anymore because it's its own great big subject. But this is covenantal language, and we're going to um, see when we get down into verse 11, what are some of the benefits of being in covenant with our Creator. For in Him dwells, no, verse 7, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith as you, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And with thanksgiving, and, and remember, you'll see this throughout the Bible, and that's the point that I like to make about for everything that Jesus has done for us, what is our response? to be grateful, to be thankful, and that is what motivates our new life, our being dead to the flesh and being raised again with Jesus. That should be our motivation for it, not to earn anything. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. I have titled you all know, I don't ordinarily do that. I've titled this lesson, It's All Jesus. Okay? And um, it's funny, funny, interesting. All the books that Paul has written, in fact, if you look at the Gospels, in fact, if you look at, at the letters Peter has written, um, in fact, if you look, as you look at the entirety of the Bible, it's all Jesus. Right? Isn't it? It's all Jesus. And I get to stand up here every week and talk about the goodness of Jesus. And it, it's, it's all it is. You take Jesus out of any part of this book and it, it ruins it. It takes it away. It makes it false. It's all Jesus. For in him, verse 9, dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we've talked about that in a i got to keep going. Verse 10, And you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. And we've talked about those principalities and powers. Those are, those are spiritual rankings of angels, whether angels in heaven or whether those fallen angels. When God created them, He created them. You, you had archangels. You had um, seraphims, cherubims. Um, and it's what the Bible refers to as um, powers and principalities and thrones and dominions, all different rankings. And um, you'll see why we're talking about that as we go on. Verse 11, in him you were also circumcised with, circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins and of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now I want to go back to verse 10. And you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. With what we just read in mind, I'm going to go back to Ephesians 2. And we've read this several times and we will read it several more times as long as you all allow me to stand up here. Ephesians 2 verse 4. Notice how what we just read, the section we just read, starts in verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, so walk in Him. Now, listen to this. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love which He loved us, 
even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of the grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the work of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. There's, there's a, Like I said, we bring nothing to the party. It is all Jesus. Um, verse 10 says, And you are complete in him. Other places, the Bible says that we're perfect. And those two words are, are basically the same word. They can be translated either way. Perfect, complete. So, look at your neighbor and say, you're perfect. Okay, now, now do it and say it like it's true. <laughs> um... Hearing that and thinking that about ourselves, for me to have that thought, I'm perfect, I'm complete. The next word that pops into my mind is, but, right? And then there's something there. I'm perfect, I'm complete, but, and you might even the next word say, I'm not. Okay? <laughs> Jesus made us complete. Paul says we're complete. When, if, if something is complete, can you picture something complete? If something is complete, what does it need? It needs nothing. It needs nothing. So... You need nothing. You're complete. My house, over three years ago, when Candy and I came here from Texas, we bought this old, she hates it when I call it this, we bought this old trailer house. Okay? She says, it's a mobile home. Fine. We bought this old trailer house. This house was built in 1979 and was placed in this spot in this, she prefers I call it a retirement community. I call it a trailer park. <laughs> and we moved here from Texas and we thought, man, this is perfect. This is the perfect way for us to come back to California. Uh, there was a problem though. Since 1979, this house had not been touched. It had not been touched. Um, it was like a time capsule. Back to 1979, you walk in there and I had that, that green, thick, shag carpet. You know the stuff, that real long carpet. Uh, these old now, I don't, this is not meant to offend any of our elderly women in this room, but I'm just saying, I had them old lady curtains with them old lady frilly, frilly, foo-foo things coming off of them. Uh, the walls were all that dark wooden paneling. And the ceiling had that old popcorn stuff on it. So I was going to spend four to six months fixing up this house. Uh, I recently just finished it. It took me three years. Um, a few months ago, I finished the last space. It was our main bathroom. And it came out great. And I'm done. 
it's complete. Okay? It's the, thank you. Thank you very much. It's complete. And I'll tell you, the day that I finished that thing, I felt like I was walking out of prison. I mean, don't get me wrong. Grateful for the house. Love the house. Um, but just the, you know, it, it just took a little longer than I thought it was going to. But it's complete. Now, somebody could come over to my house. <laughs> I'm just realizing that. I'm timing this one week before a bunch of you ladies are going to come to my house uh -huh. <laughs> and say, oh, it doesn't look done. <laughs> it could use a shelf over there, and, and I, don't, I don't think you're, you've picked the right color yet. Um, and we don't have, you know what we don't have? We don't have one of those magic cabinets. You know the magic cabinet? It's in the kitchen, and it looks like a cabinet, but it's actually a drawer when you pull on it and it comes out, and you know what's in there? The trash can. Yeah, the trash can. So, so you don't have the trash can sitting out, because that's disgusting, have a trash can sitting out in the kitchen. But we do. It's right there at the end of the island, sitting right out in the kitchen. Um, but it's complete. I'm done. It's the way I want it. And it's done. Um, somebody could come in and say, well, it, it, it could use this, it could use that, it could use this, it could use that. But guess what? You're not the owner. <laughs> I'm the owner. So I'm the one who gets to say, it's done. I'm done with this. You have an owner who says, you're done. You're complete. You're perfect. And somebody else can come along and say, yeah, but you could be doing better in this. Or there's this very important subject over here that you don't, you don't seem to get it. So even though, yeah, you're done and you're complete, there's still things you're lacking. You see how that makes no sense? doesn't make any sense. If Jesus says, I'm complete, I'm going to listen to him. I'm complete. Amen. And we have every truth, every bit of doctrine at our disposal that we need about our King and our Savior. And if something comes along and sounds like, huh, it sounds like something extra that I need to be doing, let that, let that red flag go up. You are complete. So the, uh, the Gnostics and the Judaizers were saying, yeah, this is all good, but there's a little bit more you need to know. There's a little bit more you need to do. And isn't that just such a tactic of Satan? To get in our heads, coming in, in from, from this direction of truth. Truth about Jesus. Truth about Jesus. Coming in, we expose ourselves to it. We learn about it. And, and we're learning this truth about Jesus. And then all of a sudden, this one little... Oh, and there's, there's this one other thing. There's this one other thing. Um, do our actions or our own smarts make us more complete? Can we make ourselves more complete? More perfect? Of course not. More righteous? In the Bible, it says, be holy, because God is holy. It doesn't say that exactly, but that's the idea. God is holy, so you be holy. And if you think about being holy, because God is holy, what idea does that bring to mind? What concept of holiness do you think about? 
the first one that pops into my mind is sinless. Because that's what God is. That's what Jesus is. Sinless. Be holy. Like I am holy. And I, and I think, man, I can't. I can't be holy. I, I just can't. What if that's not really an accurate picture of what's being said in that scripture? Um, does anybody have any holy dishes in their house? You don't know what I mean by holy dishes, do you? Does anybody have any fancy dishes in their house? Ah, okay. Maybe some fine china? Yeah? Maybe those, uh, those uh, used to. I, I haven't been to a wedding in so long where I've seen this happen where the married couple gets that set of that fine china, their wedding china. And had one of these in my house too. I tore it out, but it was a great big cabinet up against the wall with, with glass in the doors so that you could take those fancy dishes and put them in there and hey, look, look at my fancy dishes. <laughs> if you're making a peanut butter sandwich, do you go to that cabinet and pull out one of those fancy dishes? Oh, no, in fact, even if it is a super special occasion that does call for the fancy dishes, men, you better be careful and not chip one of those. <laughs> Don't you chip one of my plates. You might hear that come out of your wife's mouth. Um, you don't go get one of those for a peanut butter sandwich because those are, um, they're special. They're um, set apart. They're not, they're not just, they're, they're set apart. Holy. That's what that means. Be holy. For I am holy. We're not going to be sinless. Don't be silly. Don't let that get into your mind and make you think you're less than you are. You're perfect. You're complete. But you're set apart. It's Men, it's the same idea um, in that scripture where men are told to treat their wives as the weaker vessel. It doesn't mean that she's inferior and you're superior it means she's fine china that's what that means and be careful with it and it's set apart you don't just you don't just treat it like a paper plate under a peanut butter sandwich that you throw in the trash when you're done with it that's what that means so can we be more holy by anything that we can do, anything that we can muster up in ourselves, can we do that? What did those dishes do to become fancy? What did those dishes do so that to become set apart? Nothing. In fact, would you say that there's somewhere because just because of the, the, the different ways that different people live their lives and, and some people are very affluent and have all kinds of nice things and, and some of us, those, those nice things are just, they're not that important, you know. Um, but I'll bet you that if you have a cabinet with all these fancy dishes in it, there's somebody living somewhere where those same dishes are just in their cupboard, and those are the ones they do pull out for a peanut butter sandwich. Okay? And you should see their nice dishes. Yeah, that, that's really something. But what did those dishes do to be fancy, to be set apart, other than to be purchased, listen, to be purchased by someone who decided these are special and these are set apart. Okay? So do you see the parallel? 
What did you do to become complete, to become righteous, to become holy? Somebody purchased you and decided This is holy. This is set apart. This is special. And this is this is the idea. This is kind of what Paul is trying to get the readers of this letter, including us, to understand. There's no secondary teachings. There's no superior intellect. Um, there's no actions or, or religious activities that you can participate in that's going to elevate your level of completeness. Because if something is complete, what does it need? It needs nothing. It needs nothing. So then we can just go through life living like the devil, knowing that Jesus has made us righteous. Right? No. No. That's, that's, that's where the rub comes in. What does James say? Um, faith without works is dead. It, it's that thing that we have to get straight in our mind as to why do we do the things that God wants us to do when it goes against the things that our flesh wants to do. Well, <clears throat> Jesus died for all my sins. Uh, he loves me. I'm accepted. I have eternity in heaven to look forward to. So what happens on this earth doesn't matter. That was one of the things that Gnostics taught. You see, the flesh is, is dirty. And it's sinful. So whatever the flesh does, it doesn't matter. Because it, it, the flesh is sinful and, and that's what it does. What's important is the spiritual. That's what's important. That's one of the things the Gnostics were, were coming in and teaching. And then it's funny, the, but these same people had like two different camps. And the other camp was you have to completely deny the flesh of everything. Absolutely everything. You have to deny your flesh because it is filthy and sinful. And when that kind of thought process comes into our mind, when we're thinking about our relationship with God and our salvation through Jesus Christ, and these kind of things start coming into play as part of the equation, what does that do? What's the title of this message? It's all about Jesus. And where does that take our thought process? To me. This is what I have to do, or this is what I don't have to do. Um, and it gets, it gets our minds off of our King and our Savior. And, and really the only one worthy of taking up space in our brains as far as, as these questions of, of salvation and following Jesus go. Man, I'm not telling you, hey, don't tell your wife, sorry, I've only got Jesus in my head, you, you just get away. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Jesus says don't do that, actually. So, But he's the only one who's, who's worthy. Um, and when things start happening, you know who else does that besides Gnostics and Judaizers? Satan does that, right? Satan does that, bringing up our past. Even if our past, even if something in our past was yesterday, bringing up our past, saying, "Golly, you're such a joke. You're such a joke. You call yourself a Christian. You think God really loves you? Come on." It's the whole reason we need Jesus. And is and we can boast in that. We can boast in our king, but we cannot boast in ourselves. What does the Bible say about boasting? We boast in Jesus. 
because in all of our mess-ups and mix-ups, He's the one who has made you complete. Well, it doesn't make any sense, so I, I can't believe that right now. It doesn't make any sense, but believe it. Because the day's not going to come where it does make sense. It doesn't make sense. Don't wait for it to make sense before you believe that it's true for you, because it never does, and it never will. But it's true for every one of us. Okay. We are righteous through our faith in Jesus. It's all Jesus. No one can say, I'm more righteous than you. Jesus makes us righteous. We are His righteousness because of what He did. We are, I love this, we are holy dishes because He says so. But He does have good works for us to do. Well, it's not about works. No, it's not about works. So why does he have works for us to do? Because it does. That's why. You ever tell that to your kids? Well, why? Because. That's why. Um, he has works for us to do. Because that's what we're created for. That's what we're created for. He has works for us to do. Why would we do them? Well, so that he'll love us. No. So that he'll accept us. No. What is the best motivation for us to do works for our Father? <coughs> gratitude. It's just gratitude. Because without Jesus, we need to see where we would be. And where would we be? Uh, just to put it bluntly, and I don't know if this is literal or not, but no matter how you put it, it's not good. Burning in hell for all eternity is where we would be without Jesus. That's where we would be. This life would be horrible. We would constantly be looking over our shoulder because there would be no, no, um, mm -hmm. There would be no law and order. There would be no sense of, of things that we shouldn't do. It would be every man for himself and survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that this world would be. But because of Jesus and His goodness, our grateful response to our Savior and our King is to die to ourselves and to live for Him and to do the things that He has set out for us to do. Perfectly? No. No. But you're perfect. Will we do it completely? No. But you're complete. And the more that we keep seeing these shortcomings in our lives, and the fact that God picks us up, dusts us off, and sets us on our way again, the more gratitude that we can have. We've got nothing to complain about. And I'm telling myself that because lately I've found myself complaining about a lot of stuff. We've got nothing to complain about. This experience that we have on this earth is... Like that. Like that. You ever wait so long for something, and then when it's something you're looking forward to, and you're waiting so long, and you're waiting so long, and then it finally comes? How much time do you spend thinking about all that waiting you had to do and how miserable you were? No. You're waiting and waiting and waiting for something fantastic to happen, and then when it finally happens, the waiting is forgotten. It's forgotten. That helps me with the mindset for what we're going through here. We're waiting and we're waiting 
and we work for our king and we fall and we stumble and we get frustrated. But the day is coming. The day is coming. And when it comes, it's going to be like that. And all of our frustration is going to be forgotten. Forgotten. When we'll be in the presence of our King and our Savior and our Father and the Holy Spirit. And uh, golly, I'm looking forward to that. John, would you come up here? If, uh, if you have not made Jesus your King, you can do that this morning while we sing this song. If you have any prayer requests or anything like that, make that known too while we sing this song. Thank you, John. Amen. If you would stand with me.